Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the universe. So, the universe behaves like it's been kicked. Uh, we call it the Big Bang, and now space expands, is literally stretched. Uh, you could think of the galaxies like raisins uh, in a rising loaf of raisin bread. The, whichever galaxy or raisin you sit on, you look at the ones around you, and they all appear to be rushing away from you. The further away they are, the faster they appear to move because there's more space, so there's more dough uh, between you and uh, distant objects. So, how do we actually know this about the universe? This is not something we can theoretically derive. This is something we actually have to observe about the universe. So, if you look at this animation that you see here, the key aspects are that you have to measure how far away objects, galaxies, are around us, and you have to measure how fast they appear to be moving away from us. So, uh, how do we figure out how far away objects are? Uh, one of the favorite ways we have uh, is known as uh, the method of the standard candle. It's a little bit like a lighthouse in the way uh, uh, in a ship you use a lighthouse to gauge how far away the shore is by how bright it appears. In this case our lighthouse is a single star uh, which explodes in a galaxy of a hundred billion stars. So here on the right you see is a galaxy with a hundred billion stars and then one of those stars may explode and uh, we can gauge how far away it is from how bright that uh, explosion is. The inverse square law makes this very quantitative, that uh, if a supernova is twice as far away, it'll be four times as faint. If it's three times as far away, it is nine times as faint. So uh, we go and we look with our telescopes for these exploding stars in nearby and distant galaxies, and we gauge their distances from the brightness of their light. Now, the other aspect that you saw in that animation of the expansion was that uh, we see the galaxies apparently rushing away from us. How do we see this? Well, uh, the light is emitted by any object, including these standard candles, at certain known wavelengths, wavelengths of light we can determine in the laboratory. But as that light travels to us, like you see in this animation, the wavelengths of light are stretched, not uh, it's a little like the Doppler shift you may be familiar with, but the, the cause is different. It's not actually the motion of the object, it's actually the expansion of space itself. We call this the red shift and it allows us to measure this motion away from us. So we go out in the universe with our telescopes, we measure the distances, we measure the red shifts, and now I can go back to that animation I showed you, except now this becomes a quantitative science. Uh, we look at galaxies around us, we measure how far away they are, we measure how fast they appear to be moving away from us, and as I said, the further away they are, the faster they are moving because there's more space. And so this uh, plot, this little graph that you see in sort of cartoon form there, uh, is the way we measure the expansion rate of the universe. This is known as Hubble's diagram after the astronomer Edwin Hubble, who showed that the universe was expanding uh, in the late 1920s. And by measuring the slope of that line, we can tell just how fast the universe is expanding around us today. Um, now, there's a catch. I sort of uh, lied to you a little bit that I said we could tell how fast the universe is expanding around us today. And that's because we forgot to account for the fact that it takes light a very long time to reach us from distant objects. Uh, in many cases, billions of years. So we can never actually really measure how fast the universe is expanding right now, this minute. We have to look at uh, delayed information and infer, therefore, how fast the universe was expanding in the past. Now this is actually uh, very powerful for us because we can look at uh, a distant a standard candle, a supernova, like the one you see on the top row, that's more nearby, and it might be telling us how fast the universe was expanding a billion years ago. You go to the next row, find a more distant object, it's telling us how fast the universe was expanding two billion years ago, and three billion, and so on. So with this trick that we can look back in time by looking out, 
we can not only measure the expansion rate of the universe, but we can measure the expansion history of the universe. We can see how it's been changing, just like when a geologist takes a core sample of the Earth, the deepest layers tell them about the past. We have the same ability in observational cosmology. So this is good because in the mid-1990s, uh, cosmologists wanted to know how the expansion of the universe was changing. In particular, the expectation was that the expansion was slowing down. I said there was the Big Bang, but then there's all the matter in the universe and the attractive gravity of the matter would pull back and slow the expansion. And the big question was whether we lived in a very heavyweight universe like the one you see on your left, on, on your right, my left, uh, that would imply that the universe would expand, but there would be enough gravity to slow it down. It would be decelerating, and eventually it would stop expanding and start contracting, and the universe would end in something like a big crunch, the opposite of the Big Bang. Or the universe could have been the one on the right, a very lightweight universe, very little matter, very little deceleration. Uh, and like uh, a rocket with escape velocity, the universe would have escape velocity from itself. It would continue to expand forever. And it seemed like a straightforward question. Measure the amount of slowing of the expansion, weigh the universe, and figure out the fate of the universe. Um, seemed pretty straightforward for a <laughs> graduate student project. Um, <laughs> Now, not just any kind of supernova will do. There's a special class of supernovae, uh, first uh, explained by the Indian astrophysicist uh, Chandrasekhar, who won the Nobel Prize for this work, uh, explained how uh, stars of a certain type, called a white dwarf star, can only hold themselves up against the crushing force of gravity up to a certain mass, now known as the Chandrasekhar limit. Uh, when a star like our sun becomes more massive than 1.4 times the mass of our sun, you will get a runaway thermonuclear explosion. It's like nature's own standard bombs or standard candles. They all blow up at just about the same uh, mass, and so they have the same luminosity, so we can use these to track distances across the universe. When one of these explodes, we could see it halfway across the universe, or two-thirds of the way across the visible universe. Uh, they are as bright as about four billion suns. So when we did the measurement, ha, it was neither the, the heavyweight universe nor the lightweight universe. The universe was doing something completely different. It wasn't decelerating at all. It was accelerating. Again, that's like uh, you fire the rocket from the Earth to see whether it will fall back or not. And instead, it is able to just keep going and going. Uh, this was acting opposite to attractive gravity. And so we realized that the universe really is accelerating. Uh, this was the breakthrough discovery of the year uh, in Science Magazine in 1998. Uh, it's so exciting to us because it implies that about 70% of the universe is made of some other stuff. This stuff we call dark energy, its important property uh, is that it would have repulsive gravity. Now, that sounds like a pretty strange concept, but it is something that Einstein had first explained could exist in his theory of gravity. I'll say more about that in a minute. So we have a prescription now for the universe, which is that it's about 0.05% in planets, uh, about half a percent in stars, about 4% in gas. So if you add up all the material in the universe that's made out of the parts you see in the periodic table of elements, that's less than 5% of the universe. 23% uh, is in a form of matter that is exotic. We think a particle we have yet to find uh, definitively, and uh, about 73% in the form of this weird dark energy. So I'll end with just telling you our best ideas about dark energy. Um, the first idea, uh, and still the one we sort of hew closest to, is that it starts with a uh, theory in physics called quantum theory that tells us that the vacuum of space is not really empty, but it's chock full of particles that appear and disappear all the time, and that there's an energy associated with those particles, and there's a gravity associated with that energy, which, strangely enough, is repulsive and would cause the universe to sort of self-accelerate. Um, that's an interesting idea. It looks like what's happening. The problem is when we try to do calculations based on that idea, we get an answer that's about 120 orders of magnitude off 
from what we actually see. So it's just a word level idea at this point because we don't really understand why that is. But as crazy as it sounds that there's energy in empty space, we've begun to see this in other areas. So if you've heard of the Higgs boson or the Higgs field, this is an energy in empty space that we have now seen directly in the laboratory. It's not it is some dark energy. It's not our dark energy causing this, but uh, dark energy is not just uh, a made-up concept. Uh, there is another possibility that it's a transient form of dark energy. Uh, that is, it's related to a field like the electric field or the magnetic field. Uh, we think there was a field like this early in the history of the universe called inflation that uh, caused an accelerated uh, period of expansion. Uh, so it may be that these arise from time to time or the last possibility, and I think while maybe as least likely as most intriguing, is that uh, we don't really have the right theory of gravity, that uh, Newton thought he had the right theory of gravity uh, until there were certain anomalies, which uh, finally Einstein came along with a deeper understanding of gravity, which resolved those anomalies. Now we have these funny parts. Maybe we will find them directly, but we have to keep our eyes open for the possibility that this is uh, not the right theory of gravity. Um, so I will end there, and uh, Renee will pick up. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. I was just saying earlier that I've only ever seen this room from um, the television, so it's lovely to be here. Um, so Adam introduced us not only to the fantastically exciting um, concept of dark energy, but also showed us graphs um, of the history of the universe. And we're going to look at one of these again. And the, the measurements that we're making of supernovae are really made today from, from Earth, and we're looking at objects you know, a few billion years away. But I want to take us back to that time of the Big Bang, back to the really early times, and um, figure out what that time can actually tell us about other dark components. So if you're ready, this is what the early universe looked like. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> so we believe the universe started in a very hot, dense phase. And this is an artist's representation of what it would have looked like. The whole universe was in what, what, what I call my favorite state of matter, which is actually plasma. So it's incredibly hot. And um, we have protons and electrons really in this soup, this hot, fiery plasma. And they're interacting together. And what we do as uh, cosmologists who measure the cosmic microwave background is we want to use information about this time to tell us what the universe is made of. So when the universe is hot, this plasma is actually oscillating. So we have dark matter in the universe, which is pulling, like gravity, pulling all of the parts of the universe together. But because the electrons and the protons are free, there's actually radiation that's bouncing off the electrons in the early universe. And that's why we can't see through it. So the early universe is opaque for the same reason the sun is opaque. Light is bouncing around. We, we say that the mean free path is quite small. And so because this light is bouncing around, there's additional pressure. So the photons are moving and they exert a pressure. And so the early universe is really um, ringing like a bell. We call these acoustic oscillations. The key thing is as the universe expands, it cools down. And just as you take a bunch of excited five-year-olds and then they slowly get tired, they stop running around, the universe is similar. So as the universe cools down, so eventually the protons and electrons can combine and form neutral atoms. When that happens, the photons now can't interact with the electrons anymore. And the photons can propagate towards us. And those are the photons that we measure from the early time. So the light that I study has been coming towards us for over 13 and a half billion years. Okay, so what do I do? I actually measure the temperature of this radiation on the sky. But what does that tell me about the early universe? The key thing is that the temperature of this cosmic microwave background is related to the density in that early times. Because you imagine if there was a little bit of an overdensity, it would pull a little bit more because it would have gravity works, gravity sucks, as the adage goes. So the more there is, the more it attracts. And so areas that are dense um, act in, in different ways to areas that are under dense in the early universe, and they change the temperature. And so we use the temperature of this radiation to really tell us about the density in the early universe. So what do we do actually? Well, we want to measure this radiation on the sky, and the way we do that is we make a projection. We basically project longitude and latitude into the heavens. And so you'll see in this animation 
we have the sphere around our own um, earth, and then we open it up. We typically open it so that it's centered on the, gra on the galaxy, so if you see plots like that, there's a lot of very interesting stuff happening along the middle of this egg. And this is a standard map that we use, and we really want to measure what is the temperature like in this part of the sky compared to this part of the sky, because that tells us that the conditions in various parts of the sky, uh, uh, parts of the universe, were different. But in order to do that, we need to make incredibly precise measurements of the differences in the temperature. So, in fact, we know that the differences from place to place in the universe in temperature are one part in 100,000. So that's roughly one drop of water in a gallon. So only very small differences in temperature. And that's kind of interesting and very exciting. Because it's like saying, imagine if I polled everyone in this room what your favorite song was. I know you're all going to say Thriller. Um, <laughs> but, but that would be strange, because you don't necessarily know each other. But the universe, at very early times, there are very small differences. Everything is basically the same temperature. And so to measure these differences, we really need to make very precise measurements of the cosmic microwave background. So we measure it in the microwave. The radiation has been traveling towards us for billions of years, and so because of the redshift that Adam mentioned, it stretches out and becomes very cold. In fact, when we measure this average temperature on the sky today, it's only about three degrees above absolute zero, so about three Kelvin. And so we need to really build incredible instruments to measure um, the contrast between different parts of the sky. Um, and so that's what you saw in the movie. I'll play it again just so we can see. So we basically increase the precision, we take away the average, and we keep building finer and finer instruments to measure the difference from part to part in the sky. Now, of course, you'll see the big band, and that's our galaxy, um, that we need to uh, remove because it's telling us not about the early time, but about physics now. So I said the temperature was linked to density. And the way that we see that is because areas that were slightly overdense in the beginning of the universe act a bit like a sink. And so they'll trap photons inside them. And so photons at the early time, if they're in an overdensity, are a little bit colder. Areas that are a little bit less dense will be a little bit hotter. And so we can actually link the fluctuations in temperature that we see to the fluctuations in, in density. And this is a movie that was made um, by NASA and the WMAP team, which is a sp space satellite that measured the cosmic microwave background. And you can see in this animation, they're evolving time, and those fluctuations in temperature grow and become galaxies that we see today. And Risa, of course, is gonna tell us a lot more about exactly how that happens. So we have these incredible measurements of the cosmic microwave background. But what does it tell us about the universe that we live in, both now and, and its past? Well, we're really lucky. We actually have an incredibly simple model of the universe. Adam introduced it a little bit already, but we actually have just six numbers that really tell us almost everything we need to know. Now, if you haven't already read Martin Rees's book, it's fantastic, I recommend it. But in, in, the important parameters, the dark ones, um, I've highlighted in the orange circle. So the three on the, on the left tell you about what stuff is in the universe. So baryons are things like you and me, gas, and that makes up a very small fraction of the universe. Cold dark matter, that omega and the CH squared, that's telling us how much of the dark matter is in this early time. And then omega lambda is telling us about this vacuum energy or this dark energy. Um, and as Adam said, we believe that that dominates most of the energy density of the universe. There are two other parameters that tell us a little bit about those density fluctuations. And they tell us, basically, what are the sizes of the peaks. So imagine I come into this room and I say, roughly, what is the average size of the person in the room? I know that would be human-sized, right? Because I see that most of, the most of the structure in this room is people. I'd also see that there's some structure that is the size of a step. And so if I was to measure, just as a function of physical size, how much of the room is made of various things, that would tell me something about the power spectrum of fluctuations in this room. And we do something similar in the universe. We say, roughly, how big are the things in the universe? And we measure that by using a power law, which is just a mathematical formula, and that has an overall amplitude, and it has a slope. And those are two parameters. We also learn about how the universe uh, stars begin to form, but that's something I won't talk to you at all about now. 
So I mentioned this a little bit before, that we have these acoustic oscillations happening in the early universe. And it's really incredible because as this plasma is vibrating, so we have pressure from the photons pushing outwards, gravity from uh, acting on the matter pulling inwards, and so the universe really is oscillating. And the cool thing about that is if you change up the makeup of the universe, you change how that's happening. So if there's more... Um, uh, dark matter, you make the wells a little bit deeper and so the oscillations change in their structure. And we really can use these oscillations, which get transmitted in the radiation that we see, to tell us something about well, how much matter there is in the universe, for example. Here is uh, some of the most recent results. So there's, uh, there are many experiments on the ground, in the South Pole, in the Atacama Desert, and in space that make measurements of the cosmic microwave background. And they have all been working together to try and figure this, uh, figure this model out. This is from a recent um, release by the Planck satellite, which was in, in space, measuring the radiation. And you can see how the data points on that graph from three experiments match our theoretical model beautifully. And that's no mean feat, because there are only six parameters that make up that wiggly curve. And that's wonderful. We have this perfectly simple, fantastic model. Unfortunately, it has a lot of dark stuff in it that we don't understand, but it fits great. <laughs> um, and we use... Uh, understanding how these equations work in the early universe and codes to try and predict different models. And we use the data to really fit and see which one of those models makes sense. For example, if I change the amount of matter in the universe, you can see those peaks and troughs change a lot. And because we understand theoretically how that will happen, we can match the curves to the data. And that's really what I spend a lot of my time doing, is this kind of sleuthing, mix mixing data and, and theory. But something else happens. We don't only learn about the early universe. The cosmic microwave background also tells us something about what the universe is like between us and the CMB. And that's because I told you that the light has had to travel to us from uh, you know, roughly 13 and a half billion years from, from today. And so as it's, the photons are traveling towards us, they're interacting with everything else in the universe. Kind of like in the beginning, before everyone came inside, if I wanted to go to the ladies, I would have had to walk through a crowd of people. So my path would be a little bit deflected. And that's exactly what happens to the photons from the cosmic microwave background. They want to get to my eye, but you're in the way. Uh, and so these small deflections tell us something about what uh, the distribution is of, of matter and um, the geometry of the universe between us and the CMB. In this schematic, you see a little snippet of the CMB at the back. And we've drawn, an artist has drawn the photons coming towards us. And they're moving through this beautiful purple cosmic web. And the structure, the big galaxies and clusters, are going to deflect those photons. And they'll get to my eye on a slightly different path. So how does this structure change what we see? I'm going to show you two simulations of what lensing does to the cosmic microwave background. Blink and you'll miss it. <laughs> Luckily, I put unlensed and lens just in case. <laughs> so these effects are tiny. And one of the things that makes it so exciting is that we weren't able to even see this effect until a few years ago. We just didn't have the resolution. So if we had smoothed these maps over, you would never see the effects, uh, these small fluctuations from a structure. But because we now have exquisite measurements um, of this radiation, we can start to see these deflections and we can actually start to figure out what was doing that. So what was the universe made of? How much dark energy is there? How is that changing the structure? How much matter is there? What does it look like? How is it distributed along the line of sight? We learn a lot from these observations about the content of the universe at the Big Bang, the structure of the universe today, and because we have models that can take us forward in time, we really also learn about the death of the universe. Um, I don't have time to show you the movie, uh, but I worked with the TED team to make a very short movie, animated movie, about the death of the universe. I think it's fun, uh, not depressing. <laughs> it's animated, so it can't be depressing. But um, just to close, I want to uh, 
really reiterate the fact that with um, exquisite measurements and with actually pretty simple models, we're able to learn so much about the universe and what it contains and how it's going to end. Thanks. So I'm going to tell you about what happened after this uh, first moment of the universe, actually about 400,000 years after the Big Bang that you heard about from Renee. And I'm going to focus on how we get from that early time to the universe that we see today. Many of you might be familiar with this beautiful, deepest picture ever taken of the universe so far from the Hubble Space Telescope. So how did we get this beautiful set of galaxies in all their variety, all their structure on the sky, from that sort of hot, dense uh, picture that we started with very early on? We not only have these galaxies, but we also have these beautiful planets. So how do those galaxies form? How are they distributed in space? And what can that tell us actually about the physics of the universe and the part of the universe, this dark universe that we've heard about that we can't see? So as we heard already, the universe at early times was very smooth, but there were these small, tiny little fluctuations in the temperature that were mapping out fluctuations in the density. Okay, so those were really tiny in the beginning. And what we see today in the universe is that those fluctuations are very large. The universe is very clumpy. Not only do we have auditoriums full of people watching, uh, learning about new planets, but, but we also have galaxies that are actually not randomly distributed. They're quite clustered in the universe. This is a map of the nearby universe, the galaxies. This is the same projection you saw earlier. And what you're seeing here, Milky Way in the middle, but all of those other little, every single point on, this re on the rest of this plot is a galaxy that's been mapped out. And this is actually just the very nearby galaxies uh, in, terms of, in the terms that I think about, since I am really interested in the galaxies spanning the entire history of the universe. So much, much denser than the early times. That we, we saw that the early universe was about one part in 100,000. Um, the late universe is much, much more dense at sort of the very outskirts of a galaxy. It's about 200 times denser than the average. And Pluto is about 10 to the 33 times as dense as the average uni uh, part of the universe. So how does this happen? How does the universe go from you know, that baby picture to actually it might not be in its advanced years uh, uh, yet. We think we have a long way to go. So how the universe evolves actually depends on what it's made of. It depends on what are those six numbers that you heard about. How much dark matter do we have? How much normal matter do we have? How much dark energy do we have? So we actually have pretty good theoretical models for how this happens based on what those six numbers are. And the reason this is actually a fairly simple physics problem is that on large scales, gravity is dominating. Gravity really rules the show on large scales. You know, on small scales within this room, there's lots of other physical processes that matter. Um, but on large scales, gravity is really the important thing. And that means this is actually a really beautiful problem because we have the initial conditions of the universe. Uh, those initial conditions set by the cosmic microwave background tell us about what the constituents of the universe uh, are, how much matter we have, how much dark energy, how much normal matter, how much of it is dark. And we can then add gravity to this picture and it turns out that it's, it's, a, it's sort of a simple problem conceptually, but it's a very difficult problem computationally. So we also have to add a really big supercomputer. Um, we actually use the largest supercomputers in the world to do these kinds of calculations. Um, we, ran, we ran a simulation uh, just last year that took about 30 million CPU hours. Um, so, but we can do these uh, calculations quite precisely. Here's an example of one of those. Uh, this is again starting from the very early universe when it was very smooth and evolving it forward. And this is actually just looking at the dark matter in the universe. And you can see, as I told you, that it's very structured. Um, it's very clumpy and those uh, bright spots that you see there are where we think we get galaxies. So what happens is that we have this cosmological expansion. We heard that the universe is not only expanding, but it's also 
even now accelerating, but gravity is pulling things together in small regions. And in those small regions where gravity pulls things together, we get something which is no longer expanding with the universe. And the gas in those, uh, in those dense regions can actually start to cool, and then can start to form stars, and then we can get a galaxy. Um, we call those collapsed regions uh, dark matter halos. It's basically just a clump of, of dark matter that is surrounding uh, what ends up forming a galaxy, for example, like our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So this is a complicated process. Um, and here's just showing you, a, a zooming in on one of those movies, basically, to see it in a little more detail. You can see uh, in this movie, this is the formation of a, of a galaxy cluster where you have lots of galaxies coming together. You can see the universe is very active. That structure that we see exists essentially on all scales in the universe. And measuring that structure really allows us to determine something about, again, about what the universe is made of, how it evolves, and what is the basic physics that's driving it. So we heard that we have these parameters, but we don't know for sure that those parameters actually describe uh, you know, all of the universe. Maybe they just describe what's happening you know, at early times. So by, by doing these kinds of simulations and then comparing them to measurements of the universe, we can see whether this same model is actually able to describe what the galaxies look like and how they evolve and how they cluster in the universe. So this is just an example of doing this simulation now with two different sets of those numbers. And what I've done in these two movies is both of them are actually tuned to match the parameters of the cosmic microwave background. But one of them has larger fluctuations today. One of them has larger fluctuations in the early universe. And you can see that they actually evolve differently. And one of them ends up being a lot more structured than the other one. Okay? And so we can do this with all of the cosmological parameters. We can sort of run these movies forward, and we can actually test them against data. So let's take one example. Uh, we start again with those initial conditions that we measure from the cosmic microwave background. And we start again with, with this really simple idea that galaxies form at these density peaks. And that that is actually what sets the structure in the universe. So we can then use that theoretical model and make a prediction for how galaxies should cluster in the universe. And we can then actually go out with a telescope and look at how galaxies cluster in the universe. So this is an example of doing that kind of comparison. Uh, in, this, in this animation, every point on, uh, in this movie is a galaxy that has actually been mapped out by a telescope called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, that survey got redshifts for about a million galaxies. It mapped out their 3D positions in space. Um, but actually, I'm going to show you that movie one more time. And I played a trick on you, because it turns out that only half of this uh, image is the real universe, and the other half is a universe that I invented in my computer. <laughs> so I, what I did was I started with those parameters, I put it in a supercomputer, I made a prediction for where all the matter should be, and then I used this idea that the galaxies should trace that matter distribution, actually in a fairly simple way. And you can see by eye that it looks very similar, but we can also do a lot more detailed uh, statistical tests um, to decide whether this simulation actually agrees with what we observe. And uh, it's, it's quite amazing that we have this model, which is very puzzling, uh, that it involves most of the matter is not made of the same stuff as us. Most of the stuff in the universe is not even matter. But it describes supernovae, it describes the very early universe, and it describes the evolution of galaxies over several billion years with essentially just these six numbers. So it's pretty incredible, but we really do want to test this idea a little bit further. We want to, for example, Adam mentioned three possibilities for what 
could be doing this acceleration. Maybe it's just a cosmological constant. Maybe it's kind of like a cosmological constant, but it changes with time. It's some field that, that, you know, that, that is somewhat different in the early universe than it is today. Or maybe it's actually a modification of gravity. And in order to test that, one of the best ways to do that is to really expand these surveys of galaxies. Um, as I said, this a Sloan Digital Sky Survey took spectra of about a million galaxies. And the next generation of galaxy surveys will allow us to test these models with much, much higher precision. And I'm just going to very briefly tell you about two examples. Um, one example is an imaging survey called the Dark Energy Survey. This survey has already started. And just a few months ago, we published this beautiful map of the universe. This is actually just about 1 300th of the sky, so it's still a small piece of the sky. This survey, when it's done, is going to map out about an eighth of the sky. And this map is actually made using the same kind of technique that Renee told you about, gravitational lensing. But here now, we're not looking at the CMB photons, we're looking at the distortions of, of background galaxies that actually allow us, quite amazingly, because mass along the line of sight distorts those photons to map out where the mass is in the universe and to really trace not only where the galaxies are, but where the dark matter is. So, so far, uh, this, is, this survey is quite preliminary, but it's quite exciting because this survey actually is going to find a whole bunch of new supernovae. It's going to be able to do gravitational lensing. It's going to be able to find other objects that allow us to test uh, the dark energy and dark matter in different ways to really uh, decide whether these various ideas uh, match the data that we have. And then, uh, we heard about one more survey already. This is the, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. This is a different kind of survey. Instead of just pictures, we actually take spectra of the galaxies, and that allows us to make a three-dimensional map. Uh, it's quite amazing. This survey will do 35 million galaxies. Currently, there's about not quite, I think, three million galaxies and quasars that have been taken uh, by any instrument ever so far. So this will increase that by an order of magnitude. And that will really allow us to make this very precise 3D map of the universe to help distinguish between these various ideas for what is accelerating it, what is the dark matter, and how did the universe begin. So we have lots to look forward to. How do you make sure that the measurements of the cosmic microwave background don't contain any discrepancies from galaxies or stars that emit light? How do, you, how do you ensure that that radiation is definitely from the beginning of the universe? 